So I'm going to be talking to you um, today about Android testing. My name is Michael Bailey. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Yogurt Earl. I'm an engineering director uh, working on Android at American Express. And I'm going to go over one specific stack that I've found uh, very helpful uh, in our effort to automate the testing of our Android app. So what I'm going to be talking today uh, about today is the automation of just what's inside the APK. So the APK is an installable on Android. It's the piece that runs on the device. And if you want to test just that part, not your back-end services, um, and this is a little bit higher level, more of a UI test, uh, functional test, uh, than a unit test, uh, I'm going to be explaining a stack that we use to do that level of testing today. Lots of types of Android tests, many tools, many open source tools, many paid tools. I have a few, just a handful uh, listed here. Um, each one has its pros and cons. Uh, they target different types of tests. RebElectric is very popular. I'm not going to be talking really about that today, but that's great for unit testing where you have a class that you want to be able to test as a class. Um, but it also happens to have some dependencies on some Android-specific APIs. So without something like RoboElectric, you can't test it in a regular JVM, even though it's, you're just testing Java log logic. RoboElectric gives you sort of a pseudo Android environment. I have API question mark because it's not really Android. It's just sort of Android. And it, you're not really testing your code against any specific API. Um, it's useful for testing the logic in your code. There's a bunch of other frameworks and ways to test actually on top of the Android platform. Uh, everywhere from Espresso to Robotium, Solindroid, um, and there's different ways even within the Android platform to test on top of. Uh, there's instrumentation tests, which I'll be reviewing uh, briefly today, which have been there since API 1. And there's a newer uh, form of testing that's been there since API 16. Um, so today I'm going to be talking specifically about one stack. And the reason we chose this stack and the goals um, that we had are these goals. The first four are fairly common to most testing, mobile or otherwise. Um, but the last one um, is somewhat mobile specific in that you have um, a lot of mobile specific things that you want to be on a real device and you want to test against the real uh, API versions. Um, and the real idiosyncrasies of OEM skins and things that may be specific to those devices. Another one that uh, was important to us was that being e easy to debug, meaning that if a test fails, you can attach a debugger and step through it fairly easily. And the tests that I'm going to show you are all written in Java. They all run in the same uh, VM process as your app, which adds to the, the debugging um, and and makes it easier to attach a debugger using the normal Android tools and debug your tests when something does go wrong or you get a flake and try to, um, try to triage that. So specifically, I'm going to be talking about Espresso. Espresso runs within instrumentation tests. And I'm going to also touch briefly on UI automation, which was a new thing added on to instrumentation in API 18. I also want to mention there seems to be a monkey theme in some other tools I'm not going to talk about. There's monkey, which is from Google. There's monkey runner, which is something entirely different, but also from Google for testing your apps. Um, there's a few other tools. Uh, there was a thing called phone monkey, got renamed as monkey talk. There's a lot of tools to test your Android apps. The reason I'm talking to you today about espresso, instrumentation tests, wire mock spoon, et cetera, is because one, there's good Gradle support. So if you have a Gradle Android build, you can run app connected check, and it will do all the things that you need to do to build those and get them on a device and execute them. You can also do this from Android Studio, and it has um, good support for those, whereas UI Automator and some of the other things uh, may not run quite as well out of the box um, with Android Studio. The tool Spoon, which gives us some great reporting that I'll demo um, towards the end, only supports instrumentation tests. API level support instrumentation tests run across a wide level of APIs, as does Espresso. Um, and one of the themes you'll see across the tools that I'm presenting today is fluent APIs, which makes your test readable. 
Um, you can do things like Gherkin, um, which do give you readable tests, but this allows you to write your tests in Java while still having a, a level of readability which adds to maintainability. And these give you realistic tests. So if you have a problem that something's happening on you know, a specific Samsung device with a specific API, these tests can be run on a real device and you can use tests to reproduce uh, real issues on real devices. So back to what we're talking about. We're testing the APK. So in a normal usage outside of automated testing, you have a person touching the screen, manipulating the UI. Uh, in our automation, Espresso is taking the per, uh, place of that person. And Espresso goes through the instrumentation uh, test infrastructure that comes with the Android platform to get to the UI. So what's an instrumentation test? I'm gonna go over this briefly. Um, if you've never done Android testing, uh, it's just to give you a background. Um, an instrumentation test is a JUnit 3 test case. It comes with the Android platform. If you're doing a Gradle project, you put your JUnit 3 test case in Android test slash source slash Java, and the Gradle plugin and Android Studio know how to do the right thing. It generally looks like this. Um, you will extend, your test case will extend either JUnit 3 test case directly, or you will extend one of the subclasses of the JUnit 3 test case that comes with the Android framework. If you're doing a UI test, generally you'll extend activity instrumentation test case two. You tell it which activity um, that you want to start up with. And this is a, another reason that this is a, a, a useful way of doing tests in that you can, if, depending on how your app is structured, you can actually go five screens deep past the login and start your test just at one screen, bring up that screen, automate it, and bring it down, which can lead to a much faster test uh, than trying to log in and go through the whole process to get to that screen if you just need to test something on that screen. And it can be very useful in the development process to be able to say, I'm working on this screen, I wanna bring it up, operate on it, and bring it back down while you're developing. I made a code change, I just wanna run this test, and it takes you right to that activity and allows you to um, uh, test on it. So this actually will either launch the activity if it's not already launched, uh, the get activity call, or it will actually launch the activity the first time it's called for that test case. This last line here is a bit of espresso code, so you can see it's a Fluent API, uh, and it does exactly what it sounds like it does. On the view with ID foo button, it will perform a click. Um, and that's a bit of espresso code. So this is what an instrumentation test looks like. You put it in that folder, Gradle will do the right thing, and deploy it. Underneath the covers, you can do this somewhat manually, and manually, Gradle will help you with this, but you essentially have two APKs installed on the phone. Two, uh, one for your test and one that's your actual app. They have different uh, package IDs, which in Android is the unique identifier of your application on the system. So the one in your test ABK will be something like com example test, and it is targeting to instrument com example, which would be your app. And you do this by setting this up in the manifest of your test ABK. So the system knows this ABK is instrumenting this other ABK. Like I said before, Gradle has built-in support to just execute it for you with the connected check task. Or, and this is useful to know, uh, generally what it does is it packages your APKs, which you could do with Ant or whatever else you happen to be using. It does an ADB install of both APKs, both the app APK and the test APK. And then there's a command that you can use, which is ADB shell instrument. And this has a bunch of parameters that let you in uh, execute the tests one at a time uh, and things like that. And knowing how this actually works is very useful because you can, you don't always want to rebuild and redeploy the APK. If you're debugging a flaky test, you may just want to run the test a few times and attach a debugger and not have to go through the build and deploy process. So by knowing uh, ADB shell AM instrument and the flags you can pass in there, you can easily and quickly re-execute a test that's already been installed. Um, if you don't need to make changes to the test. Or if you just make changes to the test APK but not the actual APK, you can only reinstall the test APK and then run ADB, sh ADB shell AM instrument. 
So by default, if you don't pass arguments, it's going to search your entire class path of your test APK and run every JUnit3 test case it finds, uh, which can be useful, but it can also be slow because it's scanning the class path. So trying to get it to do that every time um, during development is not uh, the most efficient. You can pass things in like just run this class. You can just run one method if you do hash and method name. You can run a series of things by putting a comma in there, uh, by passing in the method name, and then maybe run a whole other class. So you can run subsets of your test um, very quickly. And this executes very quickly um, if everything's already installed on the phone. There's a lot more options. You can see the documentation here. It's on the Java doc for instrumentation test runner. So that was a brief introduction to instrumentation tests. Now, how does Espresso fit on top of instrumentation tests? So in a deployment point of view, you have one process on the Android device. Uh, your APK under test has a UI. It's probably making API calls out to a network device. And Espresso is in a test APK. But at runtime, the platform is going to combine the class path and the memory space of both, and they're both running in the same VM so that they can action, action each other and talk to each other like any Java, um, uh, two things running in the same Java uh, virtual machine can. Uh, Espresso is available here. Uh, if you're using Gradle in the current version, um, there's a thing called Double Espresso that you might want to check out. It's a gradalized version of the exact same code, and it's posted on Maven Central, so it's a little bit easier to consume if you have a Gradle build. Doesn't have 100% support for Lollipop yet. Um, I hear it's coming very soon. The progress can be tracked at there. Um, it's, so keep an eye on that. So why Espresso? As a fluent API, which, as I showed before, can make the codes readable, which make uh, your tests readable, which makes the tests more maintainable. But really, the thing that Espresso gets you is there's not great ways of built into the instrumentation API to actually, you can bring up the activity, but there's not a whole lot of great ways to manipulate it and do certain things. And, um, and spe specifically, your tests run on a thread called the instrumentation thread. And all the app code by default runs on a thread called the main UI thread. And Espresso has a lot of things that synchronize between those two. Uh, and it can remove a huge level of flakiness uh, from your tests. Um, so if you're doing UI tests on Android, you need something to synchronize between your instrumentation test and the main thread. And Espresso is very effective at doing that. Uh, it also will detect the active view hierarchy. So in Android, you can have multiple windows. Each window has its own view hierarchy. Um, and trying to make sure that you're manipulating, um, finding a view in the right hierarchy. Uh, dialogues have their own hierarchy. Pop-up windows for things like autocomplete text have their own hierarchy. Uh, Espresso has some code in there um, in a class called View Oracle, a uh, root oracle that um, will manage that for you. Um, it has support for acting on adapter views. So you have this problem of, I have a list of things. I know the underlying data that's being shown. And I want to click on the thing that's represented by this Java object. Um, but you have to scroll the list into place before you can click on it. And there's a bunch of other things. Um, so there's an on data API in Espresso that um, uh, takes care of that for you. Uh, and there's a number of extension points. So Espresso can't know everything about your app. But if it doesn't do what you want, through a combination of view assertions, view actions, and idling resources, um, these are kind of the main three extension points. You can tell Espresso a lot about your, um, your app and what you need Espresso to do. Um, and it can be very extensible um, fairly easily. So just a brief uh, detour into one of the cool parts of Espresso. So as I mentioned, there's these two threads. The instrumentation thread where your test case is running in the main thread, which is a message queue processing, animations, activity launches, and all these other things that are going on. And trying to get your test to observe that main thread in the right state. Is the view present yet? Has it been loaded? Is the activity transition happened? There's just a lot of things that can lead to flakiness. Um, Espresso has this trick where it actually will insert itself onto the main thread um, and block your test case and still it can, um, and block the main thread 
while observing the future, uh, using reflection on the main queue to observe future messages, um, while looking for the conditions it knows that your app is needed for. So it can be very fast by taking this approach because it's in the main message queue. It's actually processing each message one at a time while checking for conditions. So it doesn't need to sleep. Um, and sleep in your UI test on Android can be a huge source of flakiness. It also can really slow down your tests. Um, a good rule of thumb for writing tests, especially UI tests, is if you're doing something that won't be faster when your hardware is faster or your VM is faster, um, it, it's probably something you want to try to avoid. So if you say sleep for one second um, and you're hoping that whatever is happening happens in one second, that will never get faster. That test will never get faster no matter how fast of an emulator you put it on or whatever. Whereas if you can have this approach of looking for the condition that you want while processing each message in turn, um, assuming um, you have a faster VM, those messages will get processed faster and you will be, your test will get faster over time with faster emulators and faster hardware. If you're using Espresso, you're gonna wanna use Google Instrumentation Test Runner, which is an extension of Instrumentation Test Runner. Um, but you can also, it's kind of akin to the application class that comes in your application in terms of it's a global object that gets callbacks at some specific points in the life cycle. Um, you can actually do some cool things by extending Google Instrumentation Test Runner and hooking into there. I don't have time to get into a lot of it, but if you look at the Java talk for um, Instrumentation Test Runner and Google Instrumentation Test Runner, um, there's things like on create and various callbacks that you can extend um, to add some interesting functionality such as turning on the screen before your test runs, uh, making your app pop in front of the, the key guard and the lock screen if that's on there, um, and disabling the key guard. And there's some examples in the Spoon sample app of, of a custom test runner. Um, one thing that you can do um, is Espresso by default will, um, it has analytics in there that track the actual usage and time. Um, you can turn that off in your own custom if you want to. Um, but, you know, if you don't, it, I can understand why they would want to track the usage to see how popular it is too, so. Another thing that's interesting um, about Espresso is if you're familiar with Android development, there's this thing called an intent, and it's kind of a message passing interface. It allows you to say, I want to launch this activity. It can go through multiple processes and things like that. Um, there's an interface that comes with Espresso um, that's called Intent Spy, um, and it has things that allow you to record intents that are issued and also say whether you want them to proceed or not. So if, let's say, you have a call button and you want to hit call, but you don't actually want the dialer app to come up, but you want to make sure that the right intent was issued, you can actually um, use this to say, don't allow the intent to proceed, but record that intent and then do an assertion on that intent. Unfortunately, there's no open source implementation of this interface. The interface is included as part of Espresso, um, but you can actually roll your own by just simply using their package name and calling it intents by impl. Um, it will automatically get loaded, and you can use those methods that were uh, listed here. I mentioned UI automation. So this is a new API that came out in 18 plus. Um, it gives you a few extra things that you can do. Um, you can take real screenshots, which means you could take everything that's on the screen. If there's a dialogue, if there's another app, you'll get the system bar. Um, UI automation will give you real screenshots. Um, it uses the accessibility framework, so it gives you uh, access to any uh, UI on any app. So if you need to automate another app, um, you can do that through UI automation on 18 plus. For example, if you want to automate opening the notification drawer and clicking on something and making sure your app does the right state after that, you can do that with UI automation in 18 plus. So you can actually test a, a flow of maybe a push notification or something like that. Unfortunately, there's no current integration with Espresso, meaning that Espresso has this um, built-in logic to synchronize with the main thread, but it doesn't, by default, synchronize with anything in UI automation. So using UI automation can actually introduce flakiness um, because there's the lack of synchronization. You can use the idling resource um, API in Espresso, which is the 
main way to tell Espresso, um, to add synchronization into Espresso, and combine that with the on accessibility event listener that's in UI automation, um, and you can do a, fairly successfully, you can tie the two together to make Espresso aware of the stuff that you're doing with UI automation. So that's Espresso. You're replacing the person who would be touching the screen um, with an automated tool um, that takes care of a lot of the um, pitfalls that you may fall into trying to do this. Um, so let's turn uh, to the other side of the APK. So if I'm trying to log in or do something on the app, a lot of apps have calls out to network services. So if I want to not test my server code, but I only want to test my Android APK, how do I, um, uh, how do I replace that end of it? I'm going to talk to you today about a tool called uh, WireMock. So testing um, apps that rely on network resources uh, can definitely be a source of flakiness. You can use real endpoints. You can use your staging area. You can use some QA environment or dev environment. Um, but you have to worry about test accounts. Does the test, did the test account change? Does it have update transactions? So if I make a payment on something, is that now in the payment history? How do I reset? Um, you have network flakiness. Um, if you're going over um, a network, that server may be down. The API may have changed on that server. So there's a lot of reasons why, if you just want to test the code that's inside the APK, uh, that going against a real service can cause flakiness or cause your test to fail when it's not actually a problem with your APK. So in this, we would replace, uh, use WireMock to kind of replace uh, that level. Um, so WireMock is an open source tool. Um, the things I'm talking about today are, are open source. And it can increase your reliability by being very predictable in what it returns for specific um, requests and responses. Um, you can re reproduce real world conditions, which can be sometimes hard to reproduce, a certain account status. Um, if, your, uh, if your app is account-based or certain network faults um, that may be very hard to reproduce, especially in an automated fashion. Um, and stateful, it can also handle stateful scenarios. So I made a payment, now that should be in payment history and things like that. And WireMock is not, it's actually not specific to Android. It can be used in all sorts of technology stacks. Um, uh, so you can, even if you're not doing Android development, definitely check out WireMock and see if it fits the need that you have. Essentially, WireMock is an HTTP server, happens to run on top of Jetty, that can be configured to return canned responses uh, via a JSON API. So what do I mean configured via JSON API? So on a WireMock server, when you have it running, there's a thing called admin slash mapping slash new, where you can post to WireMock and say, when you see a request like this that matches this pattern, return a response like this. So by default, WireMock just returns 404. It gets a request. If it doesn't have a mapping, it just says 404. But then you give it these pattern matching and response things, and you can load multiple of these. Um, there's a lot of things you can put into the, uh, the matching, and then you say, uh, return this response when you see a request like this. So WireMock only does exactly what you tell it. And then it can be reset if you need to clear the state of WireMock um, and start over. So there's this JSON API that you can use for any language, right? You can post to WireMock from any language, whether it be iOS or PHP or whatever you're using, to set up these mappings. Um, it does also have a fluent Java API. So if your client um, and your tests are in Java, your job's a little bit easier in that you don't have to use that JSON API directly. This Fluent API will make those JSON API calls for you. Here is the equivalent of what I had on the previous slide using the Fluent uh, Java API client for that, uh, that API. You're saying a stub for a post on a URL matching that regular expression will return a response with status 404 in body, whoops. So this is how it would fit into your test. At the top of your test, assuming you have WireMock uh, running, you would point your app at WireMock. So you just need to replace the host name and the port number. Um, the rest of the URL can be the same. And presumably, you have that function in your app to point to your staging or your QA environments. 
And then you can, at the beginning of your test, tell WireMock, you're gonna see uh, requests like this. And when you see requests like this, return responses like so. Then you can launch your activity, you can operate on the UI, you can say, click this button, and this is using Espresso, you can say, on view, whoops, check that it is actually displayed on the screen, so you're actually controlling the data that's served so that it's all contained within one test case. Uh, that you have the text showing on the screen and you also have what was returned from the server and make sure that they match. The other nice thing you can do with WireMock is it keeps track of what requests it served. So at the end of your test, you can actually say, verify one post requested for a URL equal to Q equals foo. So you can make sure that when you click this button, your app didn't issue two requests when it was only supposed to issue one request. Um, because WireMock is uh, tracking that state, which is, may otherwise be very hard to track if you're going against um, some other uh, endpoint. So a couple of WireMock features. I, I don't have time to get into everything, um, but it is stateful, uh, meaning that you can, you can add scenarios and one request, it's, it's kind of like a state machine, one request coming in, will transition to a different set of mappings based on the state of the state machine inside WireMock. So you could say, if I'm in the scenario make payment and the state is payment due, um, I will set it to payment or maybe payment made um, when this request comes in. Um, so it allows you to do things that are stateful on the server um, and have certain scenarios and it's kind of a very simple state machine um, for the request responses during your tests. You can do errors, you can say when you get this request, return a response with this sort of fault and there's a couple different fault modes um, that are supported so that allows you to uh, more reliably automate the testing of the various error paths and fault conditions in your app. You can also introduce delays and see how your um, tests respond to that. Although, you know, you need to be careful about that because it can really slow down your tests. So where does WireMock run? So it's a Jetty server. Uh, it needs to be accessible from the device. You can run a local server on your network, which could be shared. Maybe your iOS um, devices might talk to it too. Um, you will probably need one WireMock instance per device because WireMock per instance is stateful. Um, so if you have multiple devices, running tests, talking to the same WireMock instance, and you have sta stateful uh, things going on, um, you're probably gonna run into problems. Uh, you still have that network connection, even if it's on a local host, between WireMock and the device, which is still a source potentially of flakiness. Um, but it can be made to work, and depending on your needs, and if you need multiple devices talking to the same WireMock instance, um, or same infrastructure, you may wanna do it this way. Um, you will have to have some infrastructure to coordinate, okay, I have five devices, I need five WireMock instances, they're on these ports and things like that. So it's a little bit of um, infrastructure you need to set up uh, to coordinate all that. The other thing you can do is bundle it in your test APK um, where it sits next to Espresso um, and it actually just runs in the same process. You're still connecting it to it over lo local host. All your stack of HTTP uh, client code is still running. Um, your app doesn't really know that it's just going about the, back through the loopback inter interface to um, WireMock. Um, but this can reduce a whole other level of flakiness in that it's one per device by nature because it's actually running on the device. Um, so it reduces the level of setup and coordination you need. And it also reduces the network problems because there's no real network between the two. The open source, one caveat I'll give you is the open source version doesn't support WireMock out of the box, or doesn't support Android um, out of the box. Uh, so there's a few things you have to do. Um, it's an active thing on the open source community discussing how to get it to work. I can tell you it can be made to work and it's not that hard. Um, so here's the first, uh, example I talked about where you're running it off device and your tests are talking to a WireMock instance you've spun up somewhere. But here's the other way that can even reduce flakiness more is actually running it in the test APK, which is in the same process. Um, and you talk to that directly and you have much more control over WireMock and starting it up and stopping it and resetting it. So the 
few things that if you're going to attempt to get Wiremock working inside your Android APK that you need to think about. And some of these may have changed. There's some um, ongoing work in the, on the open source too, uh, to manage some of these. Um, the logger implementation, I think it uses log4j, which could cause problems on Android. Um, it has some JUnit4 stuff in there, which may conflict with certain Android things. Um, it, ha it uses a, a different version of an Apache HTTP client. Um, so you may use, need to use jar jar to repackage that under a different package name to remove the conflict. Um, the good thing about having it in the test ABK um, is you get the 65,000 method, 65, method limit on both APKs. So even though um, Espresso includes Guava, which is fairly big, but it's not going to hurt you too much because it's in the test APK, which has its own 65,000 K method limit. And you can even do go beyond and implement things like there's a, fire, a file source API in Wiremock um, that is, can load pre-canned ma uh, mappings from a file system. Uh, you can implement that API and make it load pre-canned mappings from the Android Asset Manager. So now you've invested all this time in your tests. You've set up Espresso, you've set up Wiremock, um, you've got a pretty good uh, test rig going. You want to run these across lots of devices, and you want to maximize your investment that you've made in writing this test, because it's not always quick or easy um, or painless. So there's a tool called Spoon, um, another open source tool that I'm going to talk to you about today, that allows you to maximize that investment that you've made. It allows you to run your tests on multiple devices in parallel, so it will build and deploy, and then you can grab screenshots um, using a Spoon API and get a nice report of all of these tests that you've written run across multiple devices in a way that allows you to troubleshoot where were this flakiness, um, is it only on a certain type of device, API 15, API 16, um, and I'm going to give a brief um, demo of a sample report from Spoon. So this is the uh, sample report that actually comes from a sample app built in Spoon. So if you're interested in Spoon, you can check it out. It comes with an app that's instrumented with tests, and you can run the tests, and it'll give you the sample output. So it's very easy to take a look at Spoon and see if it's going to meet your needs. So you can see here they ran their app on seven devices. Uh, each device was running nine tests. So it says 72 tests run across eight devices. That's nine tests per device. And you can see it gives you this nice matrix of which tests pass per device. So you can see there's two devices here that had an additional failure. So it could be something about the just devices, the API version that they're running, and you can kind of dig into that to try to see why that test failed on that specific subset of devices. The other nice thing that Spoon does uh, for you is you can see which test it is by mousing over it. If you click on it, it will give you the list of tests with the screenshots for each test as it was going through. And you decide when the screenshots need to be taken um, by calling their screenshot API within your test code. So you can see that these two failed. So the one good thing is uh, about Spoon as well is it collects the logs from every device just from when that test case was running. So if you have good logs in your app and you're trying to troubleshoot flakiness, um, you can also just view the logs for the ones that failed. So here is all the logs um, from that test case on that device when that one failed, and again for this test case. The other thing you can do and the value that you can get out of this is you can click view on all devices. So I'm viewing now, before I was viewing all tests on this one HTC device. If I click here, I'm viewing this one test called blank username shows error on all devices, the HTC, the Droid, et cetera. So you can see this one was in landscape mode. This one uh, is a Nexus 7, so it has a lot of empty space on the screen in this layout. So this. Uh, it can be a very effective way to see how your layout's looking across a lot of devices in a very automated way. And you can share this with your designers so that they can say, oh, on this type of device, the spacing is not quite right, or what have you. Um, and so that can be very uh, 
helpful and help you get a lot out of the investment you've made in writing all these tests. You can also turn on an option, and it's optional, to view this as an animated GIF. So it will actually take these screenshots and play them over in an animated GIF so you can actually kind of visualize the step-by-step -step process of going through the app in that test case. All right, so I'm gonna switch back to the slides now. So I'm gonna talk briefly about CI. So there's a Spoon Gradle plugin, which allows you to, if you have a Gradle build, you can execute Spoon on top of your instrumentation tests, and it will do the right thing about building it, deploying it to all the devices in parallel, executing the tests on all the devices in parallel, pulling the logs, and generating this report. So by using this plugin, you get it, the Spoon report fairly cheaply, um, and you can use the, obviously, Jadle, uh, Jenkins Gradle plugin or whatever Gradle plugin for your continuous integration server to execute this on every check-in or however you do your continuous integration. So you can get this nice report on every code change with screenshots across devices. It works with any device that's attached to ADB, so you can use this with emulators as well. Um, and you can also, if you haven't done this, you can also connect to devices over Wi-Fi if they're not physically attached to a server using ADB Connect. Um, of course, that does add another level of flakiness. And one last thing that I'll just briefly mention is if you're doing all this and you have um, WireMock that has a nice Fluent API and you have Espresso that operates on your UI which has a nice Fluent API, there's one more tool that if you want to continue that um, theme in your tests, it's called AssertJ Android, and it has, it's built on top of AssertJ, which gives you a Fluent API for asserting things at the end of your test, but it has support for all sorts of Android APIs. So for instance, you can, if you're using that intent spy thing to block, a, block intents, but make sure that they were issued, you can do things with AssertJ Android, <coughs> like assert that the intent spy intent has the action view, so you make sure that the right intent was issued, and you can do all sorts of assertions on various Android APIs. Um, so check that out as well. And that brings me to the end of the presentation, and I think I have a um, bit of time for questions. Yeah, one of the questions from the moderator. What's the argument for these low-level test libraries instead of a black box test uh, approach taken by Solandroid Appium? So, I mean, you can use this in a, you can use this in a, I mean, you can be more kind of black box or gray box with these tools if you want. I mean, you don't have to, if, you, if your concern is knowing about the ID of a specific item, you can do more based on the text that you see in the UI. So you can use these tools a little bit more abstracted, but there is some, there's some nice things that uh, it allows you to do in terms of asserting the state inside of your app um, that you can't just do. And really, from a debugging point of view, it's tightly tied to the internals of your app and having it all in one process and being able to have the debugger step through your test code and also be looking at your app code in the same process um, can make debugging a, a lot easier. Um, that's probably one of my favorite things about doing it this way is being able to kind of debug the test and the app that's being tested at once. I'm looking for some good ways to test other services, content providers, like non-UI stuff, like content providers, services, uh, the integration with them. Is there any, a good mechanism for that in Espresso? So you're talking, about, uh, you're talking about Android so there are content providers? Yeah. Okay. I mean, integration with them, just like you have an intent spy, right? Mm. Something like that. Um, a good question. Not that I know of, but I know there's a there's an espresso talk uh, from the espresso guys later today, and maybe they have an answer. I don't know. So okay. maybe a question for that talk at the end of the day. Okay. So my second question was, uh, can I test my business logic without launching activities? 
And so yeah, so you can run things. any, you can run just plain old JUnit 3 test cases in instrumentation. Um, building an APK, deploying it onto a device, and all this may be, I mean, it's gonna slow you down if you don't really need to test. Um, if you're not really testing anything Android specific, you may wanna try to get that outside of testing an Android and do it just on a JVM. Um, either just a plain JVM if you're not calling, if you don't have any dependencies on Android APIs or using something like RoboElectric um, that kind of gives you um, enough of the Android APIs to test outside of an Android environment. It'll be much, it can be much quicker. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Another question for the moderator. Uh, with this stack, is it possible to automate test cases where you have more than one device involved? So if you have two devices talking to each other, data synchronization, messaging between the devices, can you make that happen? Between devices. Um, it doesn't, I don't, I wouldn't say it supports that out of the box. Um, yeah, you, you may be able to do, if you had, I mean, you have to have some, if you have some way of the devices talking to each other, and I know this device is in this state and this device is in that state, you may be able to tie that piece of logic that you would have to be specific to your app to something like an idling resource in Espresso, possibly, to get it to kind of pause at the right place. Um, you know, like I said, the, the, the idling resource, the view assertions, and the view actions can, help you extend Espresso to meet your test. Uh, probably wasn't meant really for that use case, but you know, you could give it a shot. Take a look at the idling resource API. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Michael.